Good evening. My name is Deirdre Cross, and I'm the Assistant Director for Public Programs here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program entitled, Historically Speaking, Built from the Fire, a Chronicle of the Tulsa Uprising by Victor Lukerson. A journalist and author based in Tulsa, Victor is a formal former staff writer at The Ringer and business reporter for Time Magazine. Victor's writing and research have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Wired, and Smithsonian Magazine, where we all became acquainted with him two years ago at the anniversary. He was nominated for a National Magazine Award for his reporting in Time on the 1923 Rosewood Massacre. He also manages an email newsletter about underexposed aspects of black history called Run It Back. Since its publication, Built from the Fire has enjoyed favorable reviews. The Kirkus Review lauds the text as a vital book for anyone who wishes to understand American race relations past and present. In another glowing assessment, Carol Anderson, renowned professor of history at Emory University and author of White Rage, comments that the scope, the elegance, and the power of Victor Lukerson's tale is simply breathtaking and empowering. So it is indeed an honor to welcome Victor Lukerson here to this museum this evening. Moderating, oh, we got a little more. <laughs> well, always time for applause for such a talented young writer. Moderating tonight's conversation is none other than our own John Franklin, who retired from the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2019 as Senior Ma Manager Emeritus in the Office of External Affairs. He's remembered for his scholarship and years of meritorious service. Four years ago, John founded with Karen Roberts Franklin, Franklin Global LLC, a speaking and consulting firm that supports initiatives that explore questions and spotlights issues of race and social equity in their most profound historical and global dimensions. It is in this spirit that I welcome both Victor Lugerson and John Franklin to the stage for the start of a most remarkable conversation. Thank you. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with Victor. Um, I want to explain my relations to this story. My great grandfather, David Burney, was born in 1820 slave to Chickasaw Indians. When they are removed from their lands in Tennessee, he walks with his owners to Indian territory, to Chickasaw Nation in the southeast corner of the state of now, what is now Oklahoma. He and his wife, Millie, had 10 children, and my grandfather, who you see here in 1901, uh, was born May 6, 1879. He attends Roger Williams University in Nashville, where this photo was taken. It's in the style section on the fourth floor of the museum. When I, when I discovered this portrait and showed it to the curators, they started fighting over it. They were, can we put it in education? Can we put it in politics? Can we put it in style? So it ended up in style. So you know the circular film on the, on the fourth floor? If you watch that, you'll see Grandpa come up. So he's in Nashville when this is taken, in 1901, as I said. 
and he marries my grandmother. They study with a man named John Hope, for whom they'll name their second son. And they farm in Springer and Ardmore, also in southern Oklahoma. And Grandpa apprentices with black lawyers from 1904 to 1907. He's admitted to the bar one month after statehood in December um, 1907. And he moves to Rentisville, an all, one of the all black towns in Oklahoma. And then February 1921, he moves to Tulsa, where just a few months later, he's a witness and survivor to the Tulsa Race Massacre. His story comes up in Victor's book because he fights the city ordinance that has people rebuild only with non-flammable materials. And he fights that successfully all the way to the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court. He also, in the next image, this is in the section we have on Tulsa on the third floor. This is the community burning. The railroad tracks are where that line of fire starts. This is downtown Tulsa in front of you. It's the oil capital of the world. And they only burn our section of the city north of the railroad tracks. Next image, please. So this is May 31st to June 1st, 1921. And this photograph is taken in a Red Cross tent, June 6th, 1921. That's my grandfather on the right. He's just turned 42. His law, law partner, I.H. Spears, on the left. And that is an African-American woman, Effie, Effie Thompson in the middle, who with her husband had had a pharmacy in Greenwood. But when it was burned to the ground with all the other uh, destruction, she asked if she could become their uh, secretary till her, she and her husband could rebuild. So the next and last image, please. The community is totally devastated. Can we have that image again, please? This is an image of a man photographing the ruins of his house. You can see the utter destruction around him. Now, Victor, I have so enjoyed your book, and particularly because it fills in so many holes in my knowledge of Tulsa and black Tulsa, in particular in the 20th century. What inspired you to become a journalist and writer? Thank you so much for the question, John, and thank you, everyone, for coming to this event. Um, this is actually my first book and my first really big book event outside of Oklahoma, so I'm so excited to be here. Um, and, you know, I think it's especially great to be talking to you as a race massacre descendant. Um, when I started traveling this story, it was so important to me to make a story about this event that was really centered on people and families. Um, and I really want to take a moment, if we could, to also just acknowledge the people in the audience who are also race massacre descendants, Greenwood descendants. Um, can y'all just stand for me for a minute so everyone knows that we have folks in this audience who are descended from that event? Um, in, the, in the audience, we have some folks who are descendants of people such as A.J. Smitherman, the editor of the newspaper in Greenwood, Mary Jones Parish, who chronicled what happened during the race massacre, uh, Lula Williams, who owned the Dreamland Theater, um, as well as the Goodwin family, who are still in Greenwood today. Um, I know there's other folks in the audience, too. And so, you know, as I said, it was really for me about uh, telling people's stories. And how that started for me, going all the way back, honestly, I've been, I've been writing since I was five years old, you know, tooling around on my parents' typewriter um, on the old MS-DOS computer before Windows was a thing. Um, and I remember when I was a little kid, I would write these little short stories about the magic school bus, and I would replace those characters with my friends. And they became these really big communal activities, you know what I mean? And writing this book has really been the first time since I was that elementary school boy that I felt like I created something that was about community, that people could really gather around um, and experience this story with, alongside me. And so it's just really, really exciting to have sort of had this book come into the world, see the way people are responding to it, and really feel like I'm tapping back into why I was inspired to write in the first place. You know, writing can be a really lonely experience when you're doing it. But the thing you create is really for a community, and I really hope this book accomplishes that as well. I think that it does. How did you first learn about the Tulsa Race Massacre, and what led you to write about it? You know, it's kind of a funny story, because for me, learning about the massacre, I honestly cannot tell you the day I learned about it. Um, how I really entered this story was really more through the legacy of Greenwood. 
Um, I remember I was living in Atlanta before starting on this journey to write about Black Wall Street. And I had a high school friend, me, we were two of only three black guys in our high school, and we were discussing the film 12 Years a Slave. Uh, my friend had never seen it. And he told me the reason he didn't watch it was because he was tired of just depictions of black people being brutalized in popular culture. You know, a lot of times our stories are really only about the trauma. That's how we're, how we're presented in popular culture. And so I asked my friend, oh, have you ever heard of Black Wall Street? My friend had never heard of it. This was 2017, so before Watchmen, before Trump came to Tulsa, before the centennial, you know, it was still in some ways a, a buried story at the time. And so I realized, you know, I think I was 27 at the time that we had this conversation. And it just felt really important to me that people my age got a chance to really understand what this community was and that there was something to our history besides trauma, death, and destruction. And so, you know, as you know, the book I've written balances the horror of the race massacre, the challenges black folks have faced with the resilience, the community, the solidarity. And it was really important to me that this book, I mean, it's the title's right there, Built from the Fire. It's about them building something after that. Um, and so for me, that was really the entry point into the story. The audience should know that uh, the man depicted in 12 Years a Slave woke up in chains at the corner of 7th and Independent Southwest. I've made sure that there's a sign there marking the, the two slave pens that were on that intersection. So when you're in the neighborhood, just go by and look at the sign. How did you become acquainted with the Goodwin family? Why, it was, it, why was it necessary to tell their history? Yeah, so for people who haven't had a chance to crack open the book yet, there's a through line in this story. Um, there are so many families represented, but a through line consistent in every section of the book from the beginning to the end is the Goodwin family. And the reason that that made sense is because they're the ones who are still there. You know, In so many ways, this book is about survival, and the Goodwins have been working on Greenwood Avenue in an area we call Deep Greenwood, where all the businesses are and where everything's been happening for so long. Um, at this point, for more than 110 years, that's amazing. Um, I remember I was doing an interview with um, Greg Robinson, who's a great guy in Tulsa, a very prominent activist. And he, he said something that really stuck with me about how like, black folks don't really have those businesses that last that long. You know, you go to South Tulsa, you go to all kind of restaurants, you'll see, you know, been in business since 1950, 1940, 1930. That's a pretty common experience for white people, but black people don't get that that often. And so I think the fact that the good ones have been there, you know, they've been doing all kinds of businesses for more than 100 years. They've owned the Oklahoma Eagle for more than 80 years. I think chronicling that, capturing that, honoring that is really important. And that's, you know, one of the things I set out to do with this book. Well, Mrs. Goodwin, Jean, interviewed me in the 70s when I started working for the Smithsonian and I was traveling with the Haitian delegation in Oklahoma. And she interviewed me for the Eagle then. Oh, wow. Last week, I was calling Jim Goodwin, the current editor of the, of the Eagle, to tell him, we, well, we've now both finished the book. Isn't it great? <laughs> well, when I called him, he says, you'll never guess who's here. Victor, his mother, father, uncle, aunt, cousin, and fiance. <laughs> so he passed the phone around, and I got to meet all of them by phone. And they're hopefully joining us virtually today. I think they are, definitely. Now, you've studied Oklahoma. How is Oklahoma a southern state? You know, I love that question because I'm from Alabama, so I'm from the, the south, you know what I mean? And when I came out here, I was really expecting, you know, kind of a Wild West vibe. I even made a black country playlist to, to, to <laughs> play as I drove across all the states and all that. So I was expecting it to be totally different. But when I started doing my research, I realized that, oh, Oklahoma, it really was this blank slate. It could have been anything, but the, the white folks in that place decided to import Jim Crow, you know? They could have made this place whatever they wanted it to be. I wrote an article for, for the Smithsonian, actually, shout out, um, two years ago. Um, it was called The Unrealized Promise of Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma, before statehood had some egalitarian elements to it. There was a time in which white students, black students, indigenous students all went to school together. There was a time in Tulsa when uh, black business owners worked in downtown Tulsa and even had white employees. I learned that in um, your grandfather's autobiography, actually. That's one of the great facts I learned in that book. Um, but 
I think when statehood arrives, Oklahoma makes a really conscious decision to say, no, we want to embrace Jim Crow. We want to put black people under the heel of white supremacy. The very first law passed in Oklahoma after statehood segregated train cars in the state. Um, from there, they segregated phone booths, cemeteries, boating trips. There were just so many minute efforts at that. Um, and in Tulsa, in particular, um, a segregation ordinance was passed in 1916 that said that if you were black, you could not live in white neighborhoods. And so, you know, over time, as we're sort of approaching 1921, Oklahoma is like becoming more and more deeply entrenched in this Jim Crow mentality. And I think it's really important for people to understand that those laws affect the way people think and they affect the way people view each other. And so I think as Oklahoma embraced the, that mentality, it really sort of set the stage for what was to come in 1921. As I've spoken about Tulsa so much in the years leading up to the centennial, and since then, I've reread my grandfather's autobiography three times. And I glean things from it that I didn't realize before, weren't important before. But right after he's admitted to the bar, he went and talked to the governor about these first laws and how he was opposed to segregation. And I think that's really bold for an African-American man in 1907 to leave Tulsa and go to the state capitol to criti critique the governor. And oh the yeah, governor. oh yeah, I gotta give a shout out to, I love, I love those stories about the early Greenwood elders doing, making those kinds of moves. And I know that, you know, fast forward about 10 years later, A.J. Smitherman did a similar thing. You know, lynch law is kind of running rampant in Oklahoma. Black boys are being lynched left and right. And he, so he went to the governor as well saying, um, after the burning of Dewey, uh, there was a town called Dewey in Oklahoma that was completely wiped, wiped out um, by a white mob before the race massacre. And um, Smitherman went to the governor himself and said, you know, we, we can't put up with this. Um, and in that case, actually, the governor ended up uh, prosecuting some of the folks involved in that attack. So I just love the fact that there were so many of these fighters in Greenwood in that early era. What was the range of businesses in Greenwood? So, you know, again, this is, a, I think, an element where my perspective changed over time. I was very invested in the Black Wall Street mythology when I started this project. And really, one of my goals, I kind of already said it, talking about my friend, was to sort of illustrate this sort of secret sauce, this magic that we must have had in Greenwood, and then maybe bring, that, bring those elements to us in the modern day. You know, what do they have in Greenwood that we don't have anymore that we can somehow recapture? And I was really surprised as I started doing my research. I would, early in the process, I lived in Atlanta. And I would sit at my kitchen table every morning and read the Tulsa Star, which is digitized in the Library of Congress. And I was reading this newspaper, and I was just so surprised because in the Tulsa Star, I would read about how uh, the streets weren't paved in Greenwood. I would read about how there were no street lights. I would read about how they wanted additional police but weren't being provided those folks. And so that really forced me to kind of like recontextualize what I was trying to convey with this book. And so, you know, there's a chapter in the book, it's called And Sometimes Better Besides, early in the story, where I really lay out what Greenwood was like. And so we have these amazing stories about Lula Williams in the Dreamland Theater, fighting for her own autonomy as, that, as her business. You know, we have stories about the creation of Mount Zion, this amazing church that opened just weeks before the race massacre. But we also have information about the poverty in Greenwood, the challenges they face trying to get basic services. Um, so for me, it was really important to sort of cast it as an actual lived-in place and not what I've come to think of as sort of the snow globe mentality. Greenwood was this sort of precious item that was untouched by the outside world. But in fact, it was being directly impacted by the outside world and the machinations of white Tulsa. And so I think when people read this book, they're going to get a really different point of view about what Greenwood actually was. Yes, destroyed. What were the most challenging aspects of writing the book? I mean, by far, it was uh, writing about the massacre itself. Um, you guys have seen this is a very big book. Um, 100 page of footnotes, 100 pages. Right, right. Um, and there's three chapters about the massacre. And I remember, you know, I had sort of been absorbing all this trauma involved with ex excavating that, looking at the photos, reading the firsthand accounts, and trying to figure out how do I sort of take all this information and present it in a way that is both true but not melodramatic, sensational, depraved. I really wanted to avoid that. Um, and so I actually remember that uh, to write that part of the book, um, there's, a hill in, there's a hill in Greenwood called Standpipe Hill. Right now there's a um, water tower there for the Oklahoma State University. 
But in 1921, standby pills where a machine gun was set and used to shoot down on Greenwood into the neighborhood during the race massacre. Um, if you go up there, you can peer out over the neighborhood. You can see the avenue where black homes are burned on one side of the street, white homes are left alone on the other, Detroit Avenue. Um, you can see in the distance where the business district would have been aflame. Um, and so I actually sat up there on that hill and wrote it out by hand, the race massacre chapters. Um, I hadn't really been writing by hand that much since I was a little kid, writing about the magic school bus, you know what I mean. And so, but it really helped me, I think, to both take it slow, you know, you have to be slower when you write by hand. So I think taking it slow like that and also being more in tune with that older, purer, more creative version of myself really helped me to sort of translate all these emotions I was feeling into something that I hope connects with people. Um, you know, it's been interesting in some of the reviews because I can see that the intensity of what I've written um, is affecting people. Um, but I also think that we have to sort of um, reckon with that. We have to reckon with the horror of what happened then. And so I hope I found a balance between representing it in a true way without being sensational. Well, Standpipe Hill, of course, now has the University of Tulsa, University of Oklahoma, Tulsa on one side with John Hope Franklin Boulevard right there. But Standpipe Hill is immediately to the left as you're looking north. And the Klan built its first clavern on the hill overlooking the black community in January 2022. What I love about your book is that it names names. It names who the Klansmen were on the city commission. It names who the insurance companies were that refused to honor their insurance policy. So when did the Klan rise to control in Tulsa city government? John, I'm so glad you framed this question this way. As John read the book, he kept calling me as he was reading it, which was just amazing for me. <laughs> um, was such a renowned academic and historian to be excited about my book. And one time he called me, he was like, Victor, you name names. And I just love the way you said that. Um, and I do. So here are, here are a couple of the names. Um, Herman Newblock was a city council city councilor in 1921. He voted in favor of the fire ordinance that would have made it impossible for Greenwood to rebuild, if not for the efforts of B.C. Franklin. Um, and he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Another name, Merritt Glass. Merritt Glass was a real estate developer in Tulsa. Um, the real estate guys had this scheme right after the race massacre to basically attempt to either buy up the Greenwood land or use this fire ordinance to force black folks to move. Mary Glass was in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and it's interesting, too, because those, those narratives, they continue afterwards. I was, I was honestly shocked to find in the 1930s when redlining was being created, there was this group called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal agency that essentially went around to neighborhoods around the, around the country and rated them on their level of credit worthiness. Black neighbors were systematically rated as D for the worst number. You, the map would be colored red, you get redlining. The Homeowners Loan Corporation agent in Tulsa, Mary Glass, the Ku Klux Klan member. And so like, these connections are so deeply intertwined. I think it's really important that people grasp that the Ku Klux Klan isn't really about like, these guys in funny costumes with the pointed hoods. It's a, it's a boys club, it's a professional network, it's a way for people in the white elite to coordinate and discriminate against others. So I think I really understood as I did the research that the Klan was less about sort of like violent hate and more about these coordinated systems they all controlled together. And to your point, um, 1922 is really the year that the Klan took off in Tulsa. I think there's been some sort of debate about like, did the Klan start the massacre, did they not? And so the fact of the matter is the Klan was sort of, bur it was burgeoning in Tulsa in 21 and I think the, the massacre itself sort of helped sort of supercharge their growth in the community. Like, where else, where, where better to embed the Klan than the place that burned the entirety of Greenwood down? You know what I mean? So. And so if you remember that image with the, with the smoke coming up, that's the area immediately south of downtown that they wanted to develop into more of downtown. And to the immediate west is the river, so they can't expand westward. The only place to expand downtown is north where we lived. What role does the media play in shaping people's understanding of events like the Tulsa Race Massacre? You know, I think this is a fascinating question because, you know, the media today is in some ways different and in some ways the same as back then. Um, in the aftermath of the Race Massacre, 
I think it's really important to understand that black media in Tulsa was very crippled. The Tulsa Star was burned to the ground, including the printing press. Um, and A.J. Smitherman was forced to flee the community um, as a fugitive. Um, you had to actually go to the black dispatch in Oklahoma City to get a true account of what was going on in Greenwood um, because the white press was saying nigger towns should never be rebuilt. They were advancing this agenda with the fire ordinance and the real estate schemes. Um, and so there really was nowhere to turn except to the black press at that time. Um, today is kind of interesting because my actual first article about Greenwood was sort of about why hasn't there really been a movie, a media depiction, why hasn't there been any kind of effort to sort of translate this history into a way that people sort of want to consume. Fast forward to Watchmen coming out the next year after I sort of started investigating. And that's a really interesting case to me because um, Watchmen obviously raises a lot of awareness about Greenwood, which is a, po a positive thing. But on the other hand, we have like the guys in the Klan robes during this scene in the opening of Watchmen, sort of depicting Klansmen as the organizers. And specifically, it's like the pointy robes Klansmen, not the white elite Klansmen. That thing is a mischaracterization of how the event unfolded. Um, and then also there's sort of a dynamic there which I took, take issue with is, which is not acknowledging the folks in the community who are part of that story, you know what I mean. Um, if you watch The Watchmen, you'll find that um, it opens in the Dreamland Theater with a young man who is somewhat similar to W.D. Williams, an actual Greenwood person, um, but that family wasn't able to be involved or even made aware of what was happening, you know. And so I think as we do media, de media depictions of this event, it's so important to center the actual families, the folks who are in this audience, so that they have a role to play, because it's their story, you know what I mean, so. Can you explain the fight with the insurance companies between 1921 and 1937? Yeah, so I think, you know, there were just so many moving parts happening after the race massacre, and the first thing that people were really after was restitution, right? Um, I love using examples to explain some of this kind of stuff. So we'll talk about Lula Williams. Um, Lula Williams had several insurance claims um, on her property, the Dreamland Theater, and this confectionery that she owned. Um, she decided to you know, claim, claim, get her claim after they were burned down. The issue was the insurance companies basically decided that they were gonna characterize what happened in Greenwood as a riot. And I actually went through, I got 5,000 pages of uh, lawsuit documents from the city of Tulsa from the county courthouse from a very lovely woman named Kitsy. She gave them to me on a CD-ROM. I had to find a CD-ROM drive uh, to read them, but I got them. I got access to them. And so I read Lula's lawsuit. Um, Lula sued the company, insurance company when they refused to pay. And so- He named the insurance companies too. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Central State Insurance, I have it in my notes. It's in the book. Um, so Lula, you know, Lula's saying, hey, they, they need to pay me. Um, that's the terms of our contract. And then the insurance companies, um, counter, they're saying, well, it was a riot, and well, it was an even-handed an even -handed attack between whites and blacks. And so that goes back to the media, the media account, right? If the media is saying it was an even-handed account, now the insurance company can cite that in their lawsuit and say, hey, we're not responsible for this. We don't, we don't cover riots. And so it's all very interconnected in terms of how, what role these different systems play. Um, Lula and so many others ultimately were not able to even have their cases heard, heard in court. There was one white man who owned, the, who owned a competing theater called the Dixie, William Redfern. His case was heard in court, but he ultimately lost. And so that tells you a lot. If the one white business owner in Greenwood lost his case, the black folks never stood a chance. And what's kind of weird, and one of these things we still need to do more research about is all these, there were hundreds of lawsuits against both the city of Tulsa and insurance companies. They're all summarily dismissed in 1937 with very little explanation. Um, I did a lot of research digging into the news reports of the time, but again, it's the white press we're, we're relying on to explain what happened. And so that's actually still a mystery. I am a little, I am excited because um, actually University of Tulsa, the law school, the B.C. Franklin Clinic, um, there's a clinic named after B.C. Franklin at the University of Tulsa, which is, makes a lot of effort to sort of help us learn more about the details of the massacre. And so they're actually going to be trying to investigate a little bit what happened in 1937. Why were all these cases dismissed? Like, that's still one of those threads we haven't quite figured out, but I think one thing, good thing about this book is that it really opens up new areas for exploration. And I think that's gonna be one of them for sure. Certainly. Um, it's fascinating that the massacre occurs in 21. The Osage murders begin in the county next door in 23. The FBI's deeply involved and invested in investigating the Osage murders 
in 23. We're in Washington. We should be able to ask the FBI, what records do you have of Tulsa in 1921? Because you know they had to be there. I called Victor about that. He said I didn't have a chance to follow that <laughs> path, but it's worth exploring. Oh, how did Greenwood rebuild only to be transformed by the expressway and urban renewal? Yeah, so just so people sort of know what they're getting into with this book, there's three parts. Uh, the opening section is about early Greenwood and the massacre. The second section is about the rebuilding, the second heyday of Greenwood, because Greenwood actually was a vibrant and thriving community between the 1930s and about the late 1960s. I don't know, people, a lot of people don't know that, but it really became an even bigger neighborhood, even more businesses. Um, I spent a lot of time sort of in like the bars and the nightclub, you really get that sense of what it would have been like to be in Greenwood in its heyday, which I think is really exciting. Unfortunately, um, once you round out to about the early 1960s, this new concept called urban renewal is being introduced across the United States. Um, urban renewal is sort of initially pitched, again, this is one of those things where I didn't, I think I had been handed a narrative that didn't quite match with what I was finding in my research and I had to sort of translate that in my own mind. Um, urban renewal is initially pitched as a very positive thing for black communities. The idea being that after decades of neglect, decades of being ignored, not only is the local government, but the federal government is finally gonna invest in your neighborhood. Um, the issue was that it wasn't really in black people's uh, best interest. Like the purpose of urban renewal was really to serve white city leaders to remake communities as they saw fit. It wasn't about giving black people autonomy over their own communities. Um, in Greenwood's case, I actually remember going to the urban renewal offices in Tulsa. They have a, they have a warehouse off Lansing Avenue near Greenwood and it literally said on the front door like do not enter but I entered. Um, and so I spent like a few weeks there going through all these archives, um, parcel, parcel allotment uh, documents, um, annual reports. And I actually remember in particular that I found one document from an annual report that referred to a black neighborhood in Tulsa as a parasite, a parasite on the city. So think about that kind of language being used to describe an actual place. Um, think about how in those documents, they never talk about people, it's only about structures, Blight. Blight, that word blight is everywhere. Um, this idea that we're gonna be able to demonize this community in a, totally, in a totally legal fashion, you know what I mean? And so that process in urban renewal in, in Tulsa takes decades, actually. Uh, it's initially introduced as a concept in the late 1950s. Greenwood, doesn't, Greenwood does not get cleared out until the late 1970s. And so I have a chapter in my book called A Slower Burn, you know, like, if the race massacre took two days to wipe out Greenwood, it took 20 years to wipe it out the second time. And in some ways, that's more insidious because it was legal, everything they did. Um, and so I think it's really important that people understand how these kind of processes work because sometimes the villain isn't gonna come in the pointy hood or twirling a mustache. It's gonna be like an actual official with your city presenting something to you as a good idea. And I think even today we, we deal with those kind of issues involving gentrification and things like that. And so, that is sort of like the narrative I try to unravel very slowly in this book. And I hope that when people read that, they'll think about, you know, how did this play out in my own community? How did urban renewal affect the black communities in my town? Um, we didn't even get into the highway, but how did the highway affect uh, the communities uh, around me? I think a lot of things that happen in Greenwood are mirrored throughout the United States. Um, and it's really important that people really excavate their own, their own community histories to understand how we got here. For those of you in the audience, as well as those of you in the virtual audience, please consider the questions you'd like to ask. Note cards will be available, it's my understanding. And uh, those of you watching virtually can submit your questions in the chat. Uh, for those of uh, us of my generation, we remember the GAP Band. And GAP Band stands for Greenwood, Archer, and Pine the three main streets in Greenwood. And you remember the song, I Dropped a Bomb on You? That's not necessarily emotional bomb. They're reflecting Tulsa being, Greenwood being bombed. So when I did a radio interview on WPFW, I said, you have to play 
I dropped a bomb on you. Um, are there any parallels between the events leading up to the Tulsa race massacre and current social and political issues in the United States? Just a few. Um, so in January of 2021, I'm doing my research. My girlfriend, Ariel, was actually with me in Tulsa. She lives in Savannah, but we were together. And you know, we were watching uh, this Capitol protest, like everyone was, and we see them, these folks breach the Capitol and go inside and start wreaking havoc in this city. And my first thought was Tulsa. My first thought was, this is exactly what I've been researching. Like, this is unfolding before my eyes, what I've been digging around about 100 years ago. Um, so I actually wrote an article for The New Yorker just days after that um, called Living in the Age of the White Mob. And it was really about sort of this, I don't know what you want to call it, this like latent rage, this latent feeling of dispossession that some white people seem to have in this country that has, if given, if given a release valve or given you know, someone to orchestrate that, like President Trump, can become a very explosive thing. And so, you know, in this column I wrote, I really, I just laid out all the comparisons between how in the Capitol riot, um, we saw people really taking revelry in the destruction, you know what I mean? In the same way that the white mob in Tulsa took a lot of revelry in that night. Many of them were drunk, we know from firsthand accounts, for example. Um, and then we also saw, I think, in the Capitol riot, an initial projection of otherness of those people. Oh, like, these are the rednecks. Or like, this is like, these are the people who are not sort of, of of the white culture, when in fact we know that a lot of those folks were like upper class people and that they were being ginned on by the President of the United States, you know. Similarly in Tulsa, I think there is sometimes with the race massacre a tendency to assume that everyone who was there was quote unquote low class. But look at the photos, you'll see guys in suits um, in the mob, you know, observing the destruction. And we also already know that the police um, and other top leading officials played a role in the orchestration of the event. And so I think that is something that I definitely observed in terms of similarities between what's going on now and what's going on back then. And then I think another big component of it, though, is the media, right? So people may or may not know that it was actually a news article in the Tulsa Tribune um, about a false rape allegation that sort of became a spark that lit the massacre in some ways. And you know, today we have all this sensational right-wing news that's embedding in people's minds paranoia about marginalized peoples all the time. And so there really are a lot of really dangerous uh, parallels that I see. Um, and I think it's really going to be a challenge for us to be more vigilant about stamping those kind of things out before they spiral out of control the way Tulsa did in 1921. Do we have any questions for us? OK. I don't have a microphone for you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Seth. For, for those of you in the virtual audience, the question concerned um, if there was any evidence that Victor found about planning this in advance and then how the state of Oklahoma became involved. Thank you. So I have a chapter in my book. The third chapter about the race massacre is called A Conspiracy in Plain Sight. Um, so I should just say sort of my perspective on it in general is that it's impossible to destroy a community with such wholesale savagery without a plan. It just doesn't make sense. You know, let's just use our logical brains. We all, we all, you've seen the picture, you know that wasn't just thought up in a day. Um, so whether the conspiracy occurred that night, whether it occurred a week before, a month before, that part of it we don't quite have. Um, but I would say this, you know, I think there sometimes is a tendency to kind of look for like a quote unquote smoking gun regarding evidence or proof the city of Tulsa is responsible. But we already have several smoking guns. You know, 
one smoking gun is the fact that the city of Tulsa, uh, one smoking gun is the fact that the city of Tulsa Police Department deputized white folks that night without even asking for their names, handing them stars, you know what I mean? Um, another smoking gun is the fact that the day after the race massacre, the real estate board already had a complete plan to take over the neighborhood. Um, I think a third sort of, I think those are, those are the things I would say are kind of like smoking guns, quote unquote. There's also some really fascinating context that people may not know that's kind of new to my research. Um, Tulsa was in a really communist panic in 1921, actually, um, like many places in the United States. There's a, there's a white man lynched the month before mm -hmm. were being accused of being communist. Right, right. There were these vigilante networks um, in Tulsa trying to stamp out the commies, quote unquote. And actually, they even went so far as to create a uh, aerial police force in Tulsa before the race massacre. So they, they, would do, they would do these like exercises to kind of show like, if the Reds invade, we're going to have these airplanes that we're going to be able to use to help stop them. So you know, there's been questions about what, the airplanes that were used, what were they for? There was the capacity already in Tulsa to use airplanes to surveil or attack enemies. And so there was all this infrastructure in Tulsa already to launch a large scale attack against whatever perceived enemy the white elite might have. And so, you know, I don't have for you that one specific fact that says we know exactly who did what in a dark room, but I think the pieces are there to assemble a logical deduction about how it unfolded. And again, I hope that we can continue to do research to find out all there is to discover on that front. In terms of the airplanes, the airplanes we use, because this is oil country before they had little airports. So the private planes owned by the oilmen would fly all across the state of Oklahoma as they were prospecting for oil. We have questions both from the virtual audience and from you right here. First one is a virtual audience question. Why don't the history books discuss the freeway being the real nail in the coffin regarding the end of the Greenwood District? Well, my history book does, so that's, <laughs> you know. We made it to that point now, that's a good thing. Um, you know, I do think that often, in some of the books I've read, there will be like one page about urban renewal, if you're telling a story about Greenwood, and even less if you're telling a story about Tulsa. Um, my book has several chapters that really sort of in walk through exactly how it played out. Um, you know, I think that a really important thing to understand on this point is that, so after the race massacre, Greenwood successfully fends off this effort to take the land, you know. B.C. Franklin files his lawsuit, which stops the fire ordinance. Um, the black landowners refuse to sell, you know what I mean. Lula Williams rebuilds the dreamland. But after, and the, all of that was a very local effort, everything was very localized in the 1920s in terms of what was going on. But then we fast forward to the 1960s, this is the federal government saying, we're gonna put a highway in this community. This is the federal government saying, not only are we gonna put it there, but we're gonna pay the city almost all the money necessary to do it. This is the federal government saying that urban renewal is the thing that black communities across the United States quote unquote need. And so I think that that, um, that strength, that power of the federal government to be the one leading it is much harder to combat. Um, so I think that's part of why it's just a much harder thing to sort of wrap your head around, I think, compared to the very local fight in 21. And that might be one reason that um, it's taken a long time for somebody to really dig into all the dynamics and explain them the way I do in this book. Thank you. How can your book and this museum be used to expand the teaching of Greenwood? Are there other models for teaching and learning? So I'm actually really excited about a program that some of my high school friends, oh, my high school friend who I was talking about Toby just slave with. So my friend now has a um, sort of media outlet in Montgomery, Alabama, where I'm from. And they're actually planning a book club this summer where they're gonna be reading my book and sort of trying to figure out what are the models that apply to Montgomery, you know? When did Montgomery experience racial violence? Um, when did Montgomery black folks get discriminated from jobs, as explained in the book during World War II? Um, when did the highway come through Montgomery and how did that aspect differ or similar to Greenwood, you know what I mean? And so I really think, I really hope that this book can be, in some ways be like a blueprint for people to really understand how their own cities came to be the way they are. So that's, I think, a really exciting prospect that we're experimenting with in our hometown and I hope I'll be able to sort of apply to other communities as well in the future. Fascinating. Another virtual, question, virtual audience question. How has the centennial anniversary of Tulsa Race Massacre in 2021 brought renewed attention to the event? 
You know, that's a really interesting question because I actually have a column coming out in The Guardian tomorrow. It's called Don't Forget About Greenwood. I personally feel that while there was a lot of attention in 2021, not that much tangible came from it. Um, you know, I think that it's really important that the families, the survivors and descendants of the race massacre get tangible outcomes. You know, they deserve reparations just as a basic example. And I think in Tulsa, there can be a real tendency to focus on symbolism. You know, we have a brand new shiny museum in the, in the community but the city of the city of Tulsa has endorsed, but the city of Tulsa is also fighting, battling a, a lawsuit right now that would provide restitution to three living survivors of the race massacre. That doesn't add up to me, you know what I mean? And so when I see the centennial, again, you read in the book, the book has a very spicy perspective on what happened in 2021. Um, but I think that people are really gonna kind of understand what's beneath the surface in Tulsa when they read this book. And I think in general, our country is really, really good at using black people's faces and their trauma to sell tickets, sell movies, all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to actually giving black people some restitution, that almost never happens. Right. The last question was indeed, what steps, if any, have been taken to seek justice or reparations for the survivors and descendants affected by the massacre? Thank you. Yeah, so people should definitely know there is a lawsuit ongoing right now in the city of Tulsa. There are three living survivors of the race massacre. The oldest, Viola Fletcher, just celebrated her 109th birthday, actually, which is amazing. Uh, and I was actually in the courtroom um, this week, or sorry, earlier this month. Um, the city of Tulsa is trying to file a motion to dismiss this case, um, essentially arguing that the effort to sort of undo all the wrongs is so broad that a court could never sort of deal with it. They're saying, you know, throw it to the legislature. Let them, let them figure it out, basically, is one of the arguments. And so um, Mother Fletcher was actually in the courtroom that day uh, when the city was trying to dismiss the case. And so right now we're actually waiting. The judge decided to wait to make a final decision on whether to dismiss this case or not. We're waiting for the final decision. Um, Expect it to come down sometime in June, I think. Um, if, the court, if the court dismisses that case, I think it's gonna be a very difficult time in Tulsa. Um, so, but I also think that if, you know, if the case gets dismissed, it's not the end of the story, right? Um, I know your father, John Hope, Franklin, John Hope Franklin, was involved in an earlier reparations case in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was also dismissed by the Supreme Court. Um, but we all know that Tulsa, Tulsa's not gonna get rid of this by, by stalling and these kind of efforts. Like, there's folks in this room right now who are descendants from this event who are gonna keep fighting for justice. There's people like me who've become sort of wound up in this, like passionate about it, that are gonna keep fighting. And so many folks come to Tulsa every year learn about what happened there, and realize that we have to do better. And so I don't, I don't think the city's ever really going to sort of solve this unless they actually solve it. You know what I mean? Another question has come in. You worked on this book for five years. How did you maintain your hope and endurance different than being a journalist? Hmm. Hmm. Endurance, uh, a lot of gummy worms, actually. There's a, those are really helpful. Um, Hope, I don't know, I actually remember um, we have a lot of Smitherman descendants in the room right now, and I had a dinner with them during the centennial um, at the Airbnb they were staying at, and I actually spoke to them about A.J. Smitherman. A.J. Smitherman was a journalist in Greenwood in the 1910s, and I'm a journalist in the, 20, the 2020s now. And so just thinking about what he went through as an example in terms of advocating for his people in terms of being completely fearless in what he said, in terms of really upholding principles um, and never really wavering from them, you know, that's the kind of thing that gives me hope. And there's so many other folks in this story, like Lula Williams being able to advocate for herself and her entrepreneurship, even in a man's world at the time, even more so than today, you know what I mean? Um, Representative Regina Goodwin, I shadowed her in the State House the last several years. And she was the only black woman in the, in the House of Representatives when she was elected. She's one of very few right now. And the amount of vitriol that gets thrown at her all the time that she perseveres through, she has to be hopeful. So if all of these folks from the 1910s to the present day who are tied up in this, in this story, who are tied up in this legacy can still be hopeful, then why can't I? Right. For those of you who have not yet seen the new exhibition on this floor on black futurism, the approach that's taken is that 
African Americans in slavery had to have hope of freedom. African Americans during Jim Crow had to be hopeful that there would be a time after Jim Crow. Therefore, we in the present need to be hopeful about our future. What advice would you give to people who want to learn more about the history of racial violence in the United States? Look in your own backyard. People really have to understand that Tulsa was not an outlier in 1921. There was racial violence unfolding across the United States just two years before during the Red Summer. Um, and I feel like even these days, I'm often being told, someone, tell, someone recently told me, for example, that there had been a race massacre in Ufala, Alabama in the 1800s tied to black political efforts that I had never heard of. And so my advice is just dig into your own community because you're going to find a story similar to Tulsa's no matter where you're from. And I think really us understanding that dark history is the only way for us to reckon with who we are today as a country. When I was being interviewed all during 2021 about Tulsa, I was getting ready to go on and do something else. I was teaching a course on um, forced migrations. And so I had to switch off of Tulsa and focus on what I was planning. And I got an email from a young Chinese American woman who said, the story of Tulsa reminds, us, reminds her of how Chinese Americans had been treated in the United States. She said there were regular massacres of Chinatowns in the 1850s, 60s, and the worst being a mob of 3,000 white and Mexican men who destroyed Los Angeles Chinatown in 1871. Oh. That gave me pause. That made me realize there was another part of our history I was unaware of. It's been mentioned recently, I've heard it recently discussed, this is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and someone was talking about all of these crimes against Asian Americans in the 19th century. Um, last question. Where can people learn more about your work and follow you on social media? Yeah, so I'm at um, vluck89, that's me on Instagram. Uh, vluck, V-L-U-C-K, that's me on Twitter. And then the best way to learn about what I'm up to is to subscribe to my newsletter. It's called Run It Back. It's at runitback.substack.com. And that's where I sort of walk through a lot of my research before it gets into a big fancy book. So you get kind of a behind the scenes look at my creative process and all that kind of stuff. So those are probably the best ways to reach me. What advice would you give aspiring writers and journalists who want to tackle complex and sensitive topics like racial violence and injustice? I mean, it goes back to where I started this. You have to center people. It's extremely important. Um, I'll tell a small story about one of the folks who was really helpful to me on this process in the Goodwin family. Jim has a sister named Gina Redondo, and she lives in Nashville. She has an incredible family archive. Like, it's an attic full of all kinds of documents telling their story, not only involving the race massacre, but, you know, all the accomplishments this family has had. And so I had to sort of figure out, like, how am I going to create a relationship, create a relationship with Miss Redondo that's not extractive, you know? As a journalist, often it's really easy to have an extractive relationship with the people you work with. Before I started working on this book, my job was really to go to different cities, spend three or four days there, write my story, and then move on with my life. Um, but in the case of Mrs. Arredondo, what I did with her is that all of this research I was finding about her family and information about her grandmother, Carly, that she was not familiar with, I actually put it all together in a notebook and mailed it to her um, along with a handwritten note. I was even able to find a photo of her father and grandfather where the version that the family had the grandfather's face was blotted out with age, basically. And I was able to basically get the folks here, in, or at a photo studio in Tulsa to restore it and sort of like help them get their history back a little bit. And so I think if you're going to tell people's stories, and especially if it, there's a trauma at the center of that, you have to be respectful of them, and you have to work with them to tell that story as opposed to extracting from them. You know, I think that's a model that um, it's, really tough, it's really tough to implement in the age of social media, shorter deadlines, content, content, content. But you know, I took my time with this book. It was a slow process. And I think that that's made it all the more valuable because it's more authentic, it's more real, and the people who experienced this trauma and the triumphs are at the, at the very center of it. I met you in 2018 when you were in Tulsa, maybe for the first time. That was my very first time in Tulsa, yeah. 
and you've witnessed a lot of what happened in Tulsa since then. What are some of the highlights you'd like to share with us in the final moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important and valuable, a blessing is what it is, that I was in Tulsa during the summer of 2020. Um, I was on the bridge that protesters shut down in Tulsa after George Floyd was murdered, as happened in cities across the United States. Um, and there's a chapter in my book that really chronicles that summer. And I think that's extremely important for a couple of reasons. A, that spirit of activism and protest, that's like pure Greenwood. And so putting that activism in conversation with the men who went to protect Dick Rowland the night of the race massacre, in conversation with the activists of the 1960s who protested Jim Crow laws in Tulsa, I think that's really important. I also think it's important that now that we're in this sort of conservative backlash to 2020, and 2020 is almost taken on this fever dream aspect, like did that really happen? Were we really there? Did we really shut down this highway? We did, and it caused change. And so I think having that story chronicled in a way that gives it dignity, in a way that preserves it forever is extremely valuable. So I'm just so glad that I was there with my little notebook writing about what unfolded in 2020, and that it's, you know, helps to sort of provide the capstone for this book that I've written. Please join me in thanking Victor. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for such a wonderful conversation, so insightful, uh, connecting 2023 to 1921 and beyond. Um, there's a book signing afterwards, uh, just minutes from here and upstairs uh, in the uh, Heritage Hall. So um, please remain seated while our, um, while our esteemed colleagues uh, leave the stage and then join them upstairs as you purchase copies of Built from the Fire and have them inscribed by Victor Lucasen. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, here in person and, um, in our and among our virtual audience and have a wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>